excuse me. I'm going to call the meeting to order. I, I want the public to know um, it's a little different tonight. We, we right now don't have a quorum. Um, because we don't have a quorum, um, we are expecting a quorum later this evening. We, we have a lot of agenda items tonight that are just informational. There are pieces that the school committee will not take a vote on. It's just an opportunity for the public to hear. So we're going to bring those up when we don't have a quorum. None of that information will be voted on by the school committee. None of it was expected to be voted on by the school committee. Um, and then um, if we don't have a quorum, we're going to end this meeting. If we do have a quorum, then we'll move to the items that we do expect the school committee to vote on and to deal with. So we'll be doing it that way. It's a little unusual. Um, this is the last week of school. We have people who are involved in um, some things that are going on. Uh, there's a little league game going on with championship, graduation. with graduation, and we also have um, somebody whose family has a work issue that just came up. So we believe we're going to have a quorum, so I wanted people to know that. Um, myself and Mr. Giamononi looked at a couple of case examples, and we believe that we can present informational item in good faith. So we're going to do that. So the first item of business is Pledge of Allegiance. So please stand if you're able and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That being said, if no one objects, I'm going to pass over the, uh, the school committee. Is there anyone here who wishes to make a public comment on something not on tonight's agenda? And again, because we couldn't, we wouldn't uh, discuss it anyways. Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Chair. Coming up this Monday, there is a town meeting, special town meeting at the high school at 7 o'clock. There is one article item, uh, one item on the uh, article uh, on the agenda for that evening, and that is for the purchase of a, a piece of land uh, off Wood Street, uh, about nine acres of land. Um, that the information is actually on the front page of the local um, gazette if anyone's looking for more information we need 150 people to have a quorum regardless of how you wish to support or not support the article we need the quorum to get the business of the town done so that would be um, this Monday evening I believe it's the 26th at the Middleborough High School 7 p.m. come on down and get your vote on thank you and I would remind everybody that that is the only article on the town meeting and so it should, in theory, be a very short town meeting. Um, if no one objects right now, I'm just going to turn it over to the superintendent's report because that's where the vast majority of informational pieces are. So, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the school committee, members of the audience. Welcome this evening to tonight's meeting. Uh, we do have a report this evening, or a couple of important reports and updates. One is the Pupil Personnel Services Update by Carolyn Lyons, Pupil, Purpose, Pupil Personnel Services Director. Carolyn Lyons, as you know, has been in the position for a year. She joins us here at the podium uh, to present her report tonight to discuss uh, her year, basically, and, and the progress that she's made in her position. Um, so welcome, Carolyn. Thank you for coming tonight. I know your family's on the way to a little trip down to Pennsylvania, so I'm yep. taking these a little bit out of order if you do have an agenda somewhere. So thank you very much and welcome. All right. Thank you. Um, so I was last here in November and I gave you an update and um, talked to you a little bit about some of my plans for the coming year and I'm going to kind of back up to November or really closer to December and bring you through the, the summer so you can have an idea of what we've been up to in the people personnel office. Um, by far the biggest item of news has been our coordinated program review process. A uh, coordinated program review is run by the state through the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. It's basically best understood as an audit of our process in um, an array of areas. It happens once every six years, and then every three years you have a mid-cycle review um, for any corrective action or any issues that uh, the state found at the previous, um, at the previous visit. So uh, that's really an overview of our process. The state is also reviewing the coordinated program review process. Thank you. And um, they have solicited opinions from area directors, superintendents. I've been involved with these meetings all year. They are actually looking to bring our process from an every six year process to really an every other year process. 
breaking it into manageable chunks. So rather, and I'll, I'll go into some detail about what the coordinated program review has meant for us this year and um, what you can expect in the coming year, but the state is actually looking to revise it, to, to pare it down and ultimately spread it out to make it more regular, uh, smaller bite-sized chunks. The areas of review include, for us, special education, civil rights, and English language education. What it, the process is ultimately a two-year process, where in the first year you conduct what's known as a self-assessment, and I'll talk a lot about the self-assessment tonight. That was completed in May um, of this year, and then we've just gotten our dates. They're gonna be coming out to do on-site visits in December. It's like the second full week of December. And in that visit, they're gonna to talk to parents, they're gonna to talk to personnel, they're gonna to talk to administration, they're gonna to talk to teachers, um, and ask really any, any host of questions they have. And then they're gonna review our files as well. Um, so for the English language education portion, ELE, there were 14 indicators that we had to prepare responses on, explaining different you know, parts of the law and how we're in compliance. And then we had to select 10 student files to be reviewed. Um, we, the number of files that you have to review are, it's determined by your incidents. For ELE, we're a low incidence district because we don't have, you know, 20, 30, 50 um, children who have English language education. So we're, we're known as a low incidence district. Uh, civil rights is a document review only. That was also completed in May. Um, and it rained, it's, an, it's an array of topics that um, we prepared our answers on and are reviewing our policies as we, as we speak. There were 27 indicators for civil rights. And then by far, special education is kind of the, the major force of, of the CPR with 38 different indicators. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the indicators because I think it's important for you to understand kind of the breadth of what this means. And then 25 selected student files. So we selected files and then the state will come in, they'll review those files and then also they can review any, any single file that we have housed here within our district. So to give you a, l a little idea, I, I had toyed with sh kind of showing you the portal, but I think it's a bit cumbersome. I wanted to summarize some of the areas that the indicators for special education include because um, as you'll hear, it covers every facet of special education. Um, assessment, uh, re requirements for students with autism spectrum disorder, it kind of focuses from the child at the very beginning and child find and um, early learners, three and four year olds. And it goes all the way through age of majority as kids reach 18. Uh, the transfer of their records, progress reports, that process, um, case screen, um, IEP development, implementation, um, dispute resolution, parent involvement, uh, the least restrictive environment, a continuum of placement options, approval and, uh, you know, approval for approved out of district placements and unapproved out of district placements age span, instructional grouping requirements, all facets of discipline, suspension, how those records are kept, how they're reviewed, our procedures, assistive technology, um, students who are privately enrolled in private schools and how we, how we meet the needs of the, that percentage of students, <laughs> related services, uh, licensure requirements, the administrator of special education, that would be my role. They ask a host of questions about me and my qualifications and that sort of thing. Um, interpreters, professional development, and um, program evaluation. So, I mean, I gave you kind of a really brief overview, but believe me when I tell you, it's very, very expansive. We, the portal opened in January and it took every bit of those five months to complete this, this work. So um, that's a large percentage of what we've been up to, but certainly not the only thing. Um, the interesting and kind of good part about this self-assessment is that it, it, it makes us go through the process of reviewing our procedures. Um, job, job, um, program descriptions, uh, program evaluations. If you're not going through this process, you're not really taking an introspective look. So in that sense, I'm lucky that in my first year, I got to engage in this process because I got to really um, digest all that we're doing here in special education. And when we get to summer projects, you're gonna see what I'm gonna, what, what I'm gonna be doing over the summer with the information that I collected. The other thing that it promoted was ongoing communication and collaboration with all buildings. We spent some of our leadership meetings talking about these topics. And that's gonna continue into the fall as we prepare for the state's visit. But the nice thing about that is that it isn't happening just in the PPS office. This is something that all the principals and all the other administrators have been working on and working towards 
um, you know, compliance. The special ed coordinators have had a huge role in the completion of this project. Um, they've all kind of divided different indicators that, you know, relate to the different buildings that they're housed in. Um, and a tremendous effort was really expended um, in that direction. One of the last indicators was program evaluation. And it asked the district every six years to produce those reports and those evaluations. So I asked around with my special ed directors group. I kind of, you know, queried how other communities do it. Program evaluation can be very expensive. I mean, really tens of thousands of dollars for an outside group to come in. And I told you in November that I felt like w with the staff that we have here in the PPS department, there's no reason why we can't do our own. So that's exactly what we did. We started with the language-based programs, um, which start really about grade two or three, but um, starting at our elementary schools and they go all the way up to the high school. So what we did, we developed a, an entire process for how we would take a look at these programs and how we could fairly evaluate them. We decided right at the outset that if I was gonna be leading this, that I had to be shielded from the data. Since I evaluate many of these staff, we didn't feel like I could ask them a host of questions and they wouldn't feel the pressure to answer. So uh, Dr. Gates actually engaged the process with me. I cultivated all of the questions that were asked. We asked questions of teachers, our speech and language staff, and our administration. And then she was able to collect the data. Um, she shared the data with me, not the raw data. So uh, to this day, I don't know who answered <coughs> what for what building. Um, we then engaged a walkthrough process using the coordinators and me, um, where we, we with especially the coordinators, I assigned them to buildings they didn't work in. Again, to try to objectively look at what was going on in our programs. Um, take a look at our program descriptions and determine, you know, is this, are we doing what we say we're doing? Are we doing it well? Are there areas of strength? Are there areas of weakness? And that's exactly what my report focused on, targeting those um, and identifying those strengths and then areas where we can improve. The report ends with specific recommendations that I'm making for the program, which involves uh, building level administration, special ed administration, teachers, speech and language pathologists, and even paraprofessionals. So the very first step was for me to share the contents of my report, which happened last week. And um, we are in the process of forming our subcommittee to move forward with things like um, evaluating our program descriptions and infusing our language-based education outside of ELA classes or English-based classes so that we can see the reach of those principles um, in other content areas. As I engaged this process, I realized that I really needed a longer plan. The language-based program is only one of our specialized programs here in the district. So as you can see, what I have created is a somewhat ambitious plan over the next um, about two and two and a half years to evaluate all of the programs that we have here in the district. So we focused first with the language-based programs, and when we pick it up in September, we're gonna move right into our, our RISE and AIMS programs, then our life skills programs thereafter, our early childhood programs, and then lastly, our social, emotional, and alternative programs. The reason I'm ending with those programs is the Walker Partnership actually did come in probably now five, close to five or six years ago, and did complete that evaluation. So I put them last only because they've had the most attention as of late. So turning to um, high quality professional development, I talked to you guys a lot about that. I had some specific ideas, and we talked a lot about our November PD, which um, was really a, a very successful day for special education in Middleborough. Um, but we didn't stop there. In January, starting in January, the PPS department, including the coordinators and myself, led um, training for our special education transportation drivers. This led to a brand new form for reporting incidences and kind of opened the communication on how to tackle behaviors and, and student needs um, on, our, on our minibuses. We, this year, um, employed a BCBA um, on a part-time basis here in our district. And I had her actually lead training for a three-part series for ESPs at the elementary level on ABA techniques and data collection. This was an, a really um, valuable and productive professional development that I got feedback from really unanimously across the board. It's PD that the buildings had been looking for, and we were able to provide it at no cost to the district. Um, we also provided best practices in the role of the ESP through using the coordinators at all levels. We do that training um, at least once a year, and I think it's helpful because this is the front line of work with our children, and I think it's uh, time well spent to constantly be talking to these individuals about what the role is um, and what the best practices are to be using. 
Um, one of the issues that continues to face our, our kids um, are diagnoses like ADHD. And you know whether or not a parent chooses to medicate their child is a very personal and private decision, not something that the district is in the business of telling parents what to do. So one of our school psychologists actually led a professional development on non-medicated strategies for ADHD that all of our counselors and school psychologists can be using in addition to some sensory processing disorder um, information. So this was a vertical professional development that included all of the buildings, um, and I think it was successful. We got to um, isolate this group, which is really the group that's going to use some of these strategies with our kids, and it was something that we haven't done recently. We also had a legal training that I brought uh, the PPS department and myself um, to go see formal and updated um, you know, laws letters from OCR, recent cases um, by a former colleague of mine that was you know, very, very valuable. And uh, it also included 504. And I did that because, again, we'll talk about this in the summer projects, but I'd like to cultivate a 504 manual because we currently don't have one. Um, and then lastly, in April, um, we brought in, and this was through our grant money that we get through the state, um, inclusive related services practices. Jan Hollenbeck came in, and I had all of my related services providers um, housed. It was actually on the same day of the legal training, sadly, because there was a snow day. But um, they came in and really started to open our minds about related service. We sometimes think of related service as something that happens when you pull kids out of the setting. And the whole concept of this training was that you don't necessarily have to do that. You can push those services right into the classroom where the kids are. Um, related services is an area that we haven't routinely provided professional development in. Um, things that our, our you know, physical therapist, our adaptive PE teacher, these are all people you know, outside of speech and language and occupational therapy that we're able to come together as a group um, and, and really talk about issues that face them every day. Um, continuing in with the, actually next week, we are running, uh, we're actually sending a team out to do responsive classroom, which is a behavioral management um, practice. And so we have selected teacher representatives, really teacher leaders, and Nichols administration, there's an entire team, I believe there's eight of them total, going to take this week-long class. And um, this is going to be beneficial to leading PBIS here at the Nichols Middle School. The other thing we're running over the summer is safety care training. Over the summer, we'll be using selected staff and administration. I have two um, special ed coordinators that are our safety care trainers, and they're going to be able to train that selected staff over the summer. And then right when we come back to school, we're going to be training the specialized program staff, which is where you're going to see the use of that uh, training come into be, and they'll have it on day one, so when the students are here on the first day, they'll be ready to go. That's at the elementary level. We're still using CPI at the secondary level. It continues to be appropriate. Um, we are also running behavior management, data collection, and de-escalation professional development in August, right when we get back with the Memorial Early Childhood Center. This was something that I'd worked closely with Holly Anderson about this year, and um, the staff feeling like they wanted more professional development in this area, more instruction. This is the kind of fastest way to do it. And it will include the whole building, which is nice, so nobody will be excluded. Um, and then lastly, one of the summer projects that I tasked with one of myself and one of my coordinators will be the development of, of um, professional development programming for the coming year for administrators. Um, you'll note that the administrators spend a lot of time into providing high quality PD, and sometimes the administrators themselves get a little bit left behind. So one of the ways to prevent that from happening is devoting some brain power to that over the summer. So what uh, one of the coordinators and I are going to be doing is developing a menu of options that I can present to the principals over the summer and then having them select. So we can decide, you know, there are going to be certain professional development days where, where they have to be in their buildings, but there are also going to be times when we can say, no, this is going to be a day for us. This is what we're going to do on that day. Um, and it's helpful to have a menu of options because you don't know that if they're out there unless somebody creates it. Um, we've continued our work with Dr. Deborah Harris. And um, we are on year three, I believe, of the work that she's done here in the district. Um, she continues to work with each building. She comes in. She works right in the classroom with our co-teachers. She digests with administration. She meets with me and administration together and separately. Um, she's been wildly popular. People really take her feedback to heart. When, when Dr. Harris is in the room, it's not used 
in TeachPoint. It's not used as an evaluative, to, an evaluative tool. It really is looking at the quality of our programming. Our teachers have come to know that and rely on that. Um, she also came to MPAC in June to present out on her work to our parent group, which I thought was also something that was time well spent. Um, her work to date, I actually asked her to devote some time into putting into a formal evaluation, again in compliance with CPR, but it was also a nice reflective practice to see where we started a few years ago and where we are today. Now, um, I'm sensitive to the fact that Dr. Harris is an independent consultant, and that's you know obviously public money that, that we have to be you know, conservative in how we use. One of the things that she and I developed this year was to identify coaches at each building level to start building capacity so that you know, there's an, there can be a, def, a definable end to Dr. Harris's work and a place where the district picks it up and continues on with those principles. So that's what we've been doing with Dr. Harris this year. I talked to you a little bit about McKinney-Vento training when I was here in November and we did have multiple, I did two different trainings. Um, one at the elementary level and one at the secondary level. I'll be doing those again. I had multiple state trainings on this topic this year that were led by um, the folks at DESE. And there have been a lot of recent updates, not just in terms of funding and how we're supposed to fund it, but you know, even the classification of children awaiting foster care and whose responsibility it's, it really is to, to fund this. It's, um, it's a tremendous amount of money, even in districts that aren't you know, high incidence districts. Um, but regulations were coming out as late as last week. So I'll be running that training probably every year because in, until the law stops changing, um, we really do need to, on a continual basis, uh, run that. And then the 504 training. The reason I didn't push to have the 504 training this year was because I, at some point in the year, realized I was going to need to do a procedure manual. So now that I know that we're going to do a procedure manual, I'm going to run that training sometime in the 17-18 school year so that staff can be given, um, particularly our 504 coordinators, staff can be given that manual, have time to read it, and then when we come together, that, that PD can be uh, more meaningful. So that brings us to summer projects for the summer of 2017. Job one is absolutely a special ed procedure manual. We do have one in existence. It was last updated probably six or seven years ago. It's a very large three-inch black binder. It is <laughs> oftentimes single-spaced. There's a lot of paper in it. Um, I, I have to tell you, it's all relevant. I, I have had a very hard time paring it down. Previous director talked about doing something smaller. Um, the coordinators really didn't like that idea, and I understand why. I think it's more beneficial to spend the time and dig into this manual, update it so that it's current, and disseminate it. Um, We've talked about putting it on the staff only tab, and I'll be handing it out at the RISE mentoring training and talking a little bit about it with our newest staff um, come August. So this is a major project. It involves all of the coordinators and me, um, a lot of manpower and a lot of expertise because the way we do things is important, and it's not just as simple as updating a, a, a procedure. It's talking about whether or not that still makes sense, whether or not it's still effective, and then whether or not it's still compliant. So that will take us a lot of the summer. And then the 504 procedure manual. Um, we don't have one in existence, so I do have to create it. I want to make sure it's aligned vertically so that you know what we're doing at the Berkeley is the same thing that we're doing at the MHS and you know every other building in between. Um, and then I need to train everybody on it. I'm comfortable doing that. I think that uh, the staff, I've talked to some of the 504 coordinators earlier today. They're excited for it. They want the training. So that's on tap for this summer. And then lastly is the Aspen and data management piece. Um, I'll be collaborating with technology and our info specialist to start looking at some of the issues that have come up. We've been working with Aspen for a couple of years. Um, but the way we house our data, what data gets selected, and how we can manipulate that data is an area I'm looking to explore, um, as well as opening up um, the rights. Right now, Aspen is dictated by you know, who has rights to see what information. And I'll be working with Info about opening up those rights to all staff. All staff are bound by confidentiality, so there's really no reason to shield anybody from information. And I'd rather people have information in their, at their fingertips so that when they're working with a child, they have every reason to know everything they need to know about, about the student. And then I thought I would end with some building base news because we have some kind of exciting things going on. We are introducing in the coming year for the first time the MCAS competency portfolio. Um, as you know, we have the MCAS exam, 
we have the MCAS exam with uh, accommodations, and then we have an MCAS alt portfolio that gets collected. Students who take an MCAS alt portfolio are taken off of a graduation track and do not receive a high school diploma at the end. They receive a um, certificate of completion. I have spent a lot of time talking with parents across all levels and over many years about the fact that there's been nothing in between. Um, the MCAS competency portfolio is finally something else. Um, it's not perfect, it's, it doesn't, you know, it actually excludes kids with uh, cognitive impairments, but for a percentage of students, it will give them an opportunity to display their knowledge in a portfolio fashion instead of a one-hit test. So I'll be working closely with the principals, um, you know, all four buildings that administer three through eight and then, and then high school. It'll be year one. <clears throat> um, I had Kim Redlon, one of the coordinators, present at leadership so that the principals all fully understand the process now. And we went through the process of kind of identifying in a very specific fashion which candidates would be appropriate for year one. Knowing that we're gonna be very much learning. It's not something that a lot of districts have done. It's actually been around before this year, but I think a lot of districts have been hesitant because there hasn't been a lot of guidance on what this has meant. Um, these principals are willing to jump in. It's kind of exciting. They're not really afraid to try anything new. And I think the kids will benefit from that. Um, and then I told you already a little bit about our language-based program subcommittee, um, but we are really looking to infuse the principles of language-based education, which look at uh, reading, writing, listening, and speaking, and infuse those principles not just into ELA content, but actually across the day for kids who are appropriate for this program. So changes will be coming um, as we you know, review our research, form the committee, and make some changes. And then lastly was the case screen process. PPS had a really, um, strong presence at the case screening process this year and all of the coordinators were there and I thought it was um, really beneficial to have district personnel at um, case screen we got to see our children at the very first entry point aside from the fact that they're really cute um, a lot of the coordinators actually ran some of the screens and it's nice to have eyes on kids one of the reasons PPS has to be involved is child find but to be honest with you, I think it's a good practice to have as many district-wide um, administrators there greeting our families so that they know that they're being welcomed by, you know, not just one building, but a district of personnel who are invested in their kids. Um, of course, we worked with the MEC because it's, you know, a MEC-run process, and we'll be looking at kind of digesting together over the summer, how did it go and how can it improve, and I'm sure it's a process that we're going to stay involved with for years to come. So um, that's pretty much what I've been up to for the last couple of months. <laughs> I, I just have a couple of things. First and foremost, um, the MCAS competency piece is extraordinarily important, and I thank you for that. I think one of the things that I remember the most uh, was your interview. And we, at, we allowed some parents to interview you, and there were a lot of questions about tracks for high school. Um, and I don't think those parents had the information and here was a group of parents that were really committed and a part of it but didn't know what was going to happen to their children as they moved to high school and that was concerning to me and I think that's a perfect example of how to change that and like you said starting in the third grade there'll be a discussion about what happened so thank you for that um, the other question I have two questions uh, one was this is I know this is your first year in charge but you've been here a while I was wondering your thoughts on moving from district-based to building-based administrators in the school system. So I just wanted to ask you about that. Yeah. Well, boy, it's a topic that we've talked about a lot, for sure, as a team. Um, all in all, I think it's been very successful. I think that, you know, <laughs> you have to have eyes on kids with, with, by people who know special education at the micro level to be effective. Um, and I say that to you as a former coordinator who was across buildings and did out of district work, uh, you lose a lot of that personal touch spread thin like that. So I know it's an investment that the community made and I, and I think it's been a worthy one. Now in terms of where we go from there, I'm absolutely looking to refine because I think that you don't want to lose the autonomy of the PPS department so we kind of talked a little bit about that as a group and what did that mean. I pulled back on the meetings this year. I met less frequently. And we've, reca we've recalibrated again. The principals are, are very, very supportive of the, of the People Personnel Services Office and 
um, I'm fortunate in that respect because even though this was year one, you know, we had issues that would come up here and there. But I can tell you they weren't at the building level. More, more of the bumps came from actually seeing those uh, employees go to the building. The buildings were actually fabulously covered. <laughs> so it, the issues were more PPS related than they were you know, building related. And not because anybody wasn't doing their absolute best or a fantastic job. But um, I am pretty confident that this permeantation is needed and effective. And most importantly, I think our kids benefited from it. So regardless of whatever kinks there are, you know, we can work that out. If the kids' needs are being met, that's really all that matters. Great. And the last question I had was, in your uh, discussion, you, you really focused a lot on training and how training was done. And so my question relates to, you know, the school community gets all the updates and when we hire people. And as you know, at various points during the year, we'll hire new um, um, ESPs or we'll hire new teachers. Yeah. How do you catch those people up? You know, somebody who comes mid-year and you, you know, you focused your training from, from uh, September to December and then they start January, how, how do you catch them up? It's funny you bring that up because I did a three-part series this fall. I, I remember telling you guys about it for new staff. And then I had, I don't know, maybe two or three new staff that came in in the middle of the year. So what I did this year was I ended up booking people privately to just come and see me. Because, because I created those trainings, um, I was able to share all my PowerPoints, and I put a lot of my information, not that I read from a PowerPoint, but I put a lot of that information in there so that it's deliberately portable. Um, but I really think that's where your coordinators and your director come into play. You have to be available to, to catch people up on really an individual basis. There's really no way to run the full PD again because of our PD schedule and really because of the way that people are needed in their buildings and with the job that they were hired to do. Um, but we remain sensitive to that. I've also worked closely with Dr. Gates, who's run the mentoring program. So she's been really helpful and instrumental in kind of telling me, hey, we're bringing on this new personnel. Let's get them caught up you know, with their goals and hooking them up with a mentor. Um, and that's how we tackled it this year. I can also tell you this year, there was a major push to have our postings up early. And a lot of our vacancies are in the process of being filled now. So I am hopeful that we will have that be less of an issue and then I can also tell you that our strategic plan absolutely zeroes in on retaining people once we hire them so I am confident based on the work that the administrators have put forward that we're going to see those numbers continue to decrease as Middleborough becomes I hope the place to work thank you Mr. Chair um, thank you for this presentation uh, this, I, I, I always get worried when we talk about because I know the budget's so tight and we look at things that we try to do ourselves and I have the utmost confidence in your presentation tonight that your, your ambitious calendar you, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna make it and I like the idea that you're doing this 504 manual in-house you could hire somebody you could probably buy one off the shelf and they'd customize it for 10 15 or 18 but you'd never really know it yourself unless you do it yourself. So I really do appreciate that because I know myself in my line of work, I get hired to create these things for people and they don't understand it. I do. But I think that that is so um, key when you, when you do stuff in-house. Not to mention the, the amount of savings that you're, you're doing, you're, you are doing for us uh, uh, budget-wise, which can be used for other resources. And that building capacity can't specify enough how I mean that's exactly what we were talking about for a district not just in P, the PPS department but throughout and um, I, I, I sat here I read I was going through your PowerPoint before the meeting a couple well, a day or so or whatever when I was looking at it I'm like okay it doesn't have enough for me to really but the, during this presentation and man you filled in it filled in all these little pieces and uh, I'm, I'm quite impressed uh, with this presentation this evening and I thank you for coming out thank you very much Thank you. Carolyn, please have a nice vacation. Thank you. Enjoy your trip to Hershey, PA. Will do. With fam. Thank you. Well, folks, next on our informational evening so thus far, uh, we have uh, Megan Quirk, who's our family resource coordinator, who has written a grant. And uh, it is to supply uh, a subscription to the interface uh, interface program run by William James College. William James College used to be the Massachusetts uh, 
School of Psychology, correct? Professional Psychology, and, and it changed its name a couple years ago recently to William James, and going back to my child psychology days, he's the father of psychology, as I recall. Um, but uh, we have a guest with Megan this evening, and it was to be Margaret Hanna, which was in your program here, your agenda, uh, but Tanya Snyder is with us tonight, and she's a clinical supervisor with the William James College and with the Interface program. So welcome, Megan, and welcome, Tanya, and we're excited to hear about the Interface program and its availability to our town. Uh, if you could slide that microphone up a little bit closer to you when you speak, um, we can listen to what you have to say. So welcome. Thank you. So I wonder if it would be helpful to go over an overview of how the process works from beginning to end, that, and then if you have any questions, feel free to jump in. Um, so we're housed through the Community Engagement Center at William James College. We do employ students, masters and doctoral level prepared students, as well as people like myself, who's a licensed mental health counselor. We're open Monday through Friday, nine to five. And we're a helpline, not a hotline. We're very careful to talk about that. There are no services available from 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, so when a resident from Middleborough can call us seeking outpatient mental health services of any kind, they connect with one of us. We're called uh, resource and referral counselors. We do about a 20 to 30 minute intake, sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit shorter, depending on the needs. We go over what they're looking for in terms of addressing through treatment, where they can get to in terms of um, locations, what their availability is, and what their insurance or payment requirements might be. We then assign them to, um, we assign them a number, that's important, uh, a case number to keep confidentiality. We use that number when we're communicating with providers, and also they can use that number when they're calling us because they may get any one of us on the phone. Within two days, they're assigned to a lead counselor. That lead counselor is responsible for introducing themselves to the caller, and also then scouring our database of providers to find a good fit in terms of those criteria that we talked about. So that location, needs, availability, um, specialty, and insurance or payment requirements. Every provider in our database is licensed yearly, or every two years, um, but we check their licenses. Um, we also check that they have had no disciplinary actions. It's free for providers to be part of our database. I think that's important and different than other databases, because what that means is we may have smaller providers that maybe can't afford to be on some of the pay for sites. Um, that lead counselor scours that database, like I said, finding what we call a good match. They use that code that was assigned to the caller to reach out to providers to ensure that all of that information is still accurate based on their profile and that they have current availability to see this client. Once we get a yes that it's a match and there's availability, we call back the caller and we tell them about this match and all the information they may need and they're then responsible for reaching out to the provider to actually secure that appointment. That process takes about two weeks. Um, they've done some research on our, uh, on our site, the beauty of being in a college. We have lots of students who do a lot of research. Um, and actually, we can do it quicker oftentimes, and we often are quicker in that process, but we allow up to two weeks just because we're you know, waiting for providers to call us back sometimes. During that whole process, we touch ba back with the caller to check in, how's it going, this is what we're working on, anything that might have changed, any needs that may be different. Once we have a yes, we provide that, like I said, and we continue to follow up with the caller to ensure that they've been able to secure that appointment, that they feel like it's a good match for them. And then if at any point it doesn't feel like a good match, we go back to the drawing board. What didn't feel like a good match? Maybe they thought they could do a male or female provider, and now the more they thought about it, they'd really just rather have a female provider. Or maybe they thought, hey, I can travel to Halifax, that's no problem, um, for a, you know, a therapist, and all of a sudden they say, well, that's actually too far, I want someone closer to Middleborough. Um, so we kind of revise and retweak. We close the case when we feel like the, the caller has said, I'm good, I have a match, I feel confident. Sometimes that we close when the caller says, I have all the information, but I'm not yet ready to move forward. 
um, or we close if they haven't been able to connect with us and we usually you know try several times to reach them and we give them what we call a warrant to close and say if we don't hear back from you we're going to close the case but our goal is really to provide a nice bridge between consumer and provider because of the funding that Megan was able to secure it is a free service for residents because to them directly they don't have to pay anything to call us or have them work have us work on their case um, and I'm trying to think it covers the lifespan so that's important to know also it's not just for students it's for any resident of Middleborough um, so we want to get the word out there that this is a great service they recently did another study and they found that of our callers, 55% reported that they had tried on their own to provide, find providers for themselves or their family members unsuccessfully. And I think it's because when you think about when you're under stress and you're calling to find help for anything, um, you're already sort of at your breaking point. And then to be told, oh, I don't have that availability. Oh, I don't take that insurance. Oh, um, I, don't, I closed that office. That's not even open anymore. Um, it gets frustrating. And you kind of throw up your hands and give up. And we kind of remove the, the barriers that exist. We, we can't create things that aren't there in the world, unfortunately. But what we can do is remove the barriers that get in the way of people finding the connection between themselves and the providers. When we do close the case, another important piece is that people can call back at any time to reopen that case. So let's say you know, you weren't ready at that time and six months have passed and you decide I'm really ready now, you just call us again and we reopen the case and, and start looking. People oftentimes will do that if they've started therapy and then decide they want medication or maybe I started services for myself and then I want services for my child or vice versa. So we're happy to reopen the case and, and begin to serve them again. So I hope I went over everything that. So Tanya, one only one need only live in Middleborough to access these services. We've fully subscribed for the entire community. If you're a 16 year old child and you're having mental health issues and you're feeling having emotions that you've never had before and want to reach out, you can reach out, correct? You can. With minors, we just are aware that we tell them that when they go to the appointment, an, a legal guardian has to sign them in. Um, and also the insurance gets billed and the legal guardian is made aware of that. So there does need to be some connection with the legal guardian before we proceed forward. Oftentimes they too don't know all the insurance or how far they can go. So we usually ask to reach out. But the, another important piece about that is that other people can call on behalf of a client. So for example, school personnel, you know, adjustment counselors um, could start the process. We do ask that they notify the family just because we'll be reaching out to the family and we don't want to blindside anyone with our call. Um, for example, Council on Aging, sometimes their staff may call on behalf of a, a client and then we'll reach out to that client to just continue the process, but they can get the ball rolling. If you're a 97 year old veteran of World War II and you're having some questions about yourself and your mental health, you can also access that, Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. So yes. this is ageless in ageless. terms of Middleborough? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the first is uh, do you have an understanding, for example, of what public transportation services are available in Middleborough? So, if a, so when looking for a person and they say, I don't have a way to get myself there. How do I get there? At least we can look that way. So we're pretty familiar with every um, town we come into learning about that system. We also have Megan, so I feel like we have a community liaison that we can reach out to. And with the advent of the computer system, we usually can figure out who we need to talk to or how we need to help them navigate that. Um, the students are very tech savvy, so it's a, that's another blessing of having them there. And then the other question I have, is there a way in which, um, for example, if you have several people who come forward presenting, for example, cutting, you have people presenting with cutting and you find out that the closest provider for cutting is New Bedford, which doesn't really maybe make sense for our community, but at least have a conversation with Megan or come back to Megan and say, you know, we're hearing about this problem with cutting. And so that maybe we can reach out as a community and get someone who can do that services to come or at least, you know, maybe one day a week spend time in Middleborough. So what happens too is that the community is provided 
twice a year a report about utilization of services. So it talks about what kind of calls are we getting, um, what age ranges are representative of the callers. Um, that helps us kind of tweak what we might need to working together. Um, what groups are we missing? So are there particular populations that aren't calling us from Middleboro? And is it because we haven't reached out to them enough to notify them or help get them to the service? So it is a collaborative effort. That first report will come out, although the numbers are likely to be very low because it takes a while to get the word out in the community. Events like this help. We have two more coming up um, at the end of August. So my hope is that we get more and more momentum. That's usually what happens um, as time rolls out. So the first report would be the beginning of July. And it's it, just data. Yes, yeah. it's raw. Yeah, it's not the raw data. It's just overview of um, age ranges, gender, nothing identifiable or specific to clients who are calling. And if I can just recommend to you, personally, I think one of the best places to um, go is Crazy Days because it's such a wide variety of community um, that you could you could give out information there and, and that would be give a wide range of people across the spectrum ability to see what was out there. We're happy to talk about setting that up. Great. Yeah. Mr. And to reiterate what you had just mentioned, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is anonymous. No one here gets any information on personal, it's just people being able to seek out help Absolutely. without the worries that anyone's going to know about it. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure people hear that because yes. I know that, you know that, and I want them to know that. Yeah, that can be a barrier, right? So when people call again, they're assigned a code. That code is really used to talk about them even with the providers. The providers don't know the client's name until the client calls and sets up the appointment with the provider. And the data that we're providing is really global in terms of age range, gender, um, and that is really to just identify where we may be missing segments of the population to reach out to. So for example, if we notice that no callers are elderly, um, it may be beneficial for us to reach out more to the Council on Aging and figure out how we can partner. So none of that is identifiable with name, address, location, any of those pieces. I would like to let the school community know and the community know that Megan Quirk is our Family Resource Center Coordinator but reached out to McLean Hospital and wrote this grant. So thank you, Megan. I don't know if you'd like to say a few syllables uh, about this process. Sure. <clears throat> so I was um, really excited to hear about Interface because we have families that will, will come my way um, through the, the different school um, teams. And uh, when parents are ready, we want to be ready. And so to be able to share this information with a parent who's ready to take this step um, instead of or in lieu of handing them a six-page document that has a list of providers and saying, here, um, you know, here you go if you want to make some calls or I can make some calls, but I need all of your information. And, and so taking that step away and, and having this wonderful resource um, is just invaluable, I think, for our families who are, um, as Tanya mentioned, you know, in a, in, a, in a tough spot. And when they're ready, if they can have it simplified, um, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to share it. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful. How does somebody get a hold of you? Contact him. So um, Megan has these wonderful, there's several ways. So people can go online at interface, all capitals, uh, .williamjames.edu. And on the web page, there's a great deal of resources also, which I didn't mention, but I think are important to note. So there's um, the town page. So mm -hmm. Middleboro has its own page, which okay. Megan manages. Mm -hmm. um, there's links to all sorts of resources from the school system to Council on Aging to Veteran Services, um, also how to contact us. There's also a wealth of guides. So if people are just wondering about the process of therapy, about insurance information, they can access that. But our phone number is on there also, and it's 888-244-6843. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Nine to five, Monday through Friday. Do you have towns that post signs anywhere, um, whether it be in, in town commons or whatever, that, that 
to sort of have a description. Campaign, political campaign signs, if you will, about that size or a real estate sign? Yeah, so we have um, different towns do different things. We've heard of people creating banners and sort of more um, formal, bigger things that they post. I know a lot of communities will have police and firemen have them these flyers in their car, and if they feel like it's uh, appropriate, they'll hand them out. A lot of the guidance counselors will have them, school adjustment counselors. Um, the library often will post them and have some flyers available for residents who may come in seeking some literature or information. Um, people have gotten really creative about how they do that. Some people have also done print ready um, versions which we could talk about that go in the local paper to notify um, staff, you know, community members. So, yeah, there's She's lots of options. On this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is great. I would really suggest too is if the size is right, mm -hmm. the G&E will put the flyer in with the bill mm -hmm. and that gets mailed home to every person yeah. who get, has, either has That's gas similar. or electric, which is 92% of the town. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, interface will be having a representative at our employee fair in August so yeah. that's I don't know if it'll be Tanya or Margaret but okay. they will certainly be orchestrating that so we're really happy to be able to share that with our whole staff in one sitting with respect to that would uh, an employee of ours be able to use the service if they're not a resident of Middleborough no no unfortunately okay. it's only for the residents of Middleborough we have like the EAP and things like that. That's right, the EAP. Yeah, we do, which is similar in nature. But uh, oh, do we have, what What neighboring towns have it? Or you're spreading like wildfire. Yeah, uh, you're putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> there's 55 communities throughout the state of Massachusetts, and keeping them all in my head is a little challenging. Um, but we're in Plymouth and on the South Shore in five different communities on the South Shore area. So those are probably your closest communities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next on my report, we have a couple of informational items from Mrs. Piatelli with regard to a boiler bid update for the John T. Nichols Junior Middle School, a technology grant, higher education partners contract, uh, and a discovery tech books. So, Mrs. Piatelli. Thank you. Um, so the Nichols Middle School Boiler Replacement Project was funded at the town meeting this past April and we were able to reconnect with the engineer that worked with us on the hot water tanks here and he had done a lot of the work, the design work um, back two years ago. So he came back on board, he updated the design and created the bid documents and the specifications were available last Wednesday, June 14th for any vendor interested in participating. We had an optional informational site visit this past Tuesday, June 20th. Uh, we had eight potential bidders participating in the walkthrough. Our bid opening is um, next Thursday, June 29th at 1 p.m. Um, we should be ready to make a recommendation to the school committee early July, so we may need to schedule a special meeting for that. And the reason is that there's usually a six to eight week lead time to order the equipment and we want to be done by Columbus Day. So that would kind of line up with that. And as I said before, the project is funded through a town meeting article. So if anyone has any questions on the board. Um, the plan currently is to hold our meeting on the 13th of July because that would uh, give enough lead time the problem lies in that, if I'm correct, the person helping us with our bid, there are several people who are unknown to him, and if they come in at the lower bidder, are going to he's going to have to, he said he's going to require more diligence because he hasn't dealt with these companies, and so we may push that back a little, or what we may do is just hold the meeting the 13th, and then the week after hold a one-item meeting for the bid opening, and we can even do that during the day if I could get a quorum type of thing. So I just wanted people to know that that was our plan. And we, it's our understanding that next week he'll have a better idea how long it will take him to vet. As soon as we have the opening and he see who actually yeah. puts a bid in, yeah, he will. So we're going to shoot for the 13th currently because we believe that's the earliest we can get in and give enough leadway um, to get this project done. Anyone else? 
So my next item is the Digital Connections Partnership Grant. And we are pleased to report that the Middlebar Public Schools has been selected as one of 16 school districts across the state to participate in the Digital Connections Partnership Grant. This is a competitive grant that was submitted in October by Ellen Driscoll, the Chief Technology Officer. And the grant total that we receive is $37,938. Now the application was due in October and um, the money has to be spent by next Friday, June 30th, and we were notified Informally, we were notified in March and April, but we didn't have any paperwork in our hands to say, okay, we got it. Um, we had originally scheduled this work, it's all complete, and we were gonna use capital money. So now we'll be able to supplement this grant money, pull back the capital money, and pay for the um, firewall that was on the list to be paid for. Um, this grant, in connection with E-rate funding is used to increase the Wi-Fi access um, in the Nichols Middle School, Mary Good, and the Birkeland. The Memorial Early Childhood was not included in the grant because they're already saturated with Wi-Fi. And the high school was included, but they were not accepted because of our feasibility study. They pulled us back because we're in line, we're doing the feasibility study. So. Um, it was a long year waiting for this money, so, but we're very happy that we received it and will be put to good use. Mr. Chair? Yes. I'm just thankful that we were ready to go to spend this money and didn't have to make one big trip to Best Buy. True. Yep. <laughs> yep. Well, the, the whole thing is for infrastructure, so, right. yeah. Well, we could have bought extra. Access points. Yes. Uh. <laughs> $37,000 worth. <laughs> um, so higher ed partnership, higher ed partnership contracts. So higher ed is a company that teams up with community colleges to improve science labs and opportunities for training in the health field. Um, higher ed has partnered with two community colleges in Ohio, three in Massachusetts, one being Massasoit. The other two are Bristol Community College and Northern Essex. Um, what they do is they lease or purchase property and then they rehab it to create science labs in areas like um, our EMT program over at Massasoit, ours I call it. Um, so Massasoit is not directly our tenant at the Lincoln D. Lynch School, higher ed partners is. And their lease runs out next Friday, June 30th. So they asked for a one year extension because they're changing their business model where they're getting away from the brick and mortar and they're doing online courses. So they've already worked with DCAM in the state and have turned over the leases with Northern Middlesex and um, Bristol Community College. And I think with the change in administration over at Massasoit, they haven't gotten there yet with the new president. So um, they didn't want to renew for five years so we did meet with um, Steve Wynn the representative from the company and he explained the whole program and we did grant him a one-year extension so we just wanted to let you know and things will be changing over there I guess eventually so they're gonna do online science science in labs yes yeah, so they're, they're doing that through the Ohio school I don't really know I don't think they're doing labs. It seems, but, it seems very difficult to yeah, do Yeah, virtual work. science programs. I'm not sure. Well, but I know hands on component. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> I know they've done a great job over at Massasoit and the parking lot over the town hall is always packed. When, when will they come back to us and start talking to us as to what their future plans are? Did they say, we'll talk with you in December or something? We or? didn't put a date, but we did ask them to kind of stay in touch and let us know. We spoke with them. I think his hope is that he's going to be able to negotiate with the new president and board at Massasoit so that they can then become the folks that are leasing directly from us and perhaps pay them an amount for the renovations that right. they did. I think he has a number on it. Right, because when they pay, Massasoit pays them a rent, but then they also pay them a fee for every student that signs up for the science, and that goes towards their capital investment that they made in the building. So I don't know where, whether it was like a 10-year payoff for them or what, and we're five years into it. So it's more looking, it's looking as though Massasoit may continue with our 
partnership here in the downtown. Mm-hmm. Looks that but way. But directly with us instead of doing it the way they were doing it in the past. That's Correct. their hope. We That's I'm okay. not sure if Massasoit's a willing. Hmm. Right. Now, now, in 2010, I believe, when the building was first rehabbed, Massasoit was our tenant. Right. Oh, I remember right. That. Okay. So then now the last five years, higher ed's the tenant. So it will probably go back to being Massasoit again. But I know they're growing, but... Oh, hey, Mr. Chair, the, the, I would say the sooner the better because I just would hate to come to June 1st and then say, we're out of here. Right. Um, because I'll, there are other community colleges that may be looking for a recently renovated facility or maybe we do something else. But the sooner we put it out there, the, so the better <coughs> if they're not going to take us up on uh, staying with us. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be nice, it, just one of those things, it'd be nice to know, we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, no, we can actually check in with Steve yeah. Wynn on the next four Thank or five months. Um, so the next one is the Discovery Science textbooks. And um, the elementary principals have been doing a lot of research on the new science standards and all that that entails for the new MCAS tests. So the um, new science, new science, science standards yeah. that are coming now. So we currently have science textbooks with Discovery Ed in grades three, six, and nine. And they are, um, this was the program that the elementary principals, after they looked at an array of things, really liked and thought fit in with what they have. And they wanted to, they're going to be looking to expand it to the other grades and um, then next year when the three six and nine are up roll those into f so it's a five year it's a six year license that we would pay over three years but for this coming year we would only pay for kindergarten first second fourth and fifth and then the following year we would renew grades three six and nine and then pay for these so um, I can't answer any questions about the whole science tech books, but as far as the funding, um, Lisa did a good job talking to the salesperson and they are agreeable to splitting it over three years. So it would be like $20,000 this year and then next year it would be 18000 and 18000 for grades K, 1, 4, and 5. And then when we include grades 3, 6, and 9, six, seven, eight, nine. We would only do it over five years, but we would write it in so we would get this year's cost price. And might be confusing you, but next year will be our final payment on the Envisions upgrade that we did over three years, so it would be working perfectly, because that money would be available next year to do the next two years of the whole science textbooks for this year included in our budget under textbooks textbooks well we have te a textbook we have some funding under a textbook line it's not dedicated to a building it's in the general what we call um, 390 okay. which is but it's it's in the current budget it is okay it That's is all. yes yes and if I could ask just one other question related to that. I know we had a discussion in budget subcommittee about kits. And my understanding is that the principals had decided to essentially form their own kits um, rather than buy a, a kit, mainly because of cost. Do you want to come down, Lisa? And I just want to, the thing I want to make sure of is sort of the kits we're going to buy and the pieces that we're going to put in those kits directly relates to the discovery textbook and things in those textbooks yes so what we did was it's really loud sorry so what we did is we looked at te textbooks um, we looked at kit, just kit based and then we looked at a tech book and with the addition of the new devices that were purchased last year the tech book was definitely the way to go with our, our teachers because we were looking for the content piece um, first and foremost to get um, the information to our students the kits 
can be created. Um, I did send Mrs. Franco um, some information that she had requested, um, and every single lesson has a hands-on component to it. But they're not always user-friendly. A lot of these um, experiments, shall we say, some of them are not um, teacher-friendly. Some of them are for a lab setting. So we, to purchase kits, when I talked to um, the Discovery Ed rep, she said, really, you're doing the, the best, the most economical and the, the, the best thing you can do for your district because you buy these kits, they're going to cost you three times as much as what you can, you can build on your own. Um, when I, for example, when I went to Mary Kay Good, I cleaned out the science closet. It was a little scary. <laughs> there were things that just didn't get used. And we want to make sure that what we're buying is being used. And we want to build kits that are um, student friendly and teacher friendly and are able to be done in a classroom setting for 25 students. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So we have, I, I had sent, like I said, Mrs. Franco, the list of every single hands on activity. And there is one that goes with, with every lesson, pretty much. And we're going to be able to, you know, we need, as the year goes on, we're going to build these kits to say, what do we need, you know, for um, plants, to watch our plants grow? Okay, we need to buy soil. We need to, because if you buy it too far in advance, it becomes no good. The battery, I mean, I had to get, we had batteries that were exploding in the, you know, they just weren't used, you know. So we want to make sure that we're building and using our money wisely. And this is, allows us to do that. Is there an expectation of, I don't know, either a number of, experiments for lack of better terms right. or an expectation mm -hmm. of you can do 25 yep. here's five I definitely want to see done right. and mm -hmm. you, know, you know that's what I mean it, along with the piece of you know when you buy a program that's great but it's not we don't run our schools by programs right. so this is going to be that year you need the launch year of okay, what are we going to do? You know, because you should do a little bit of fidelity the first year to know what works and what doesn't work. So that will be built this year of the expectation this year will be, you know, yes, we want you to sit, you know, as a grade level team, as a PLC, we want you to sit and pick, you're going to do X, Y, and Z experiments, you know, how did it work? Let's get some feedback. Are we going to do this next year? Should we replace this next year? Because it wasn't, it wouldn't achieve the outcome we wanted with this experiment. Yeah. So what else can we do? There's a writing component. It's it's a really nice program. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other questions about this? Mr. Chair? Yes. I just did some quick math, and it looks like it's for this piece, which is K1245, which is five grades, at $60,000 for the cost, is about $50 per student for six years' worth of textbooks. Three thousand dollars, correct. That uh, that's pretty reasonable considering what a textbook in college costs right. today, um, and it's adaptable and it matches up mm -hmm. with what we need to teach. The other thing that's great with a tech book, I'll be honest with you, because the standards are so new, they just came out in 2016. We know there's going to be changes, there's going to be updates, there's going to be you know, with a with a hard copy textbook, if there's updates, you're stuck with that book for until you do another adoption. Whereas if there is a change to the standard, that company changes it immediately. I mean, which is nice for us because we don't have to pay extra for their updates, which is which is great. Other questions? Please. Mr. Chair, That's right. I just want to thank you. I had some initial questions when mm -hmm. I saw in your improvement plan that this mm -hmm. was the curriculum you were looking to launch in our district and you spent a great amount of time walking me through the, the program. Um, the capabilities and also going through what the potential, you know, hands-on component mm -hmm. of this science curriculum would be. So I just want to thank you. That really helped You're provide welcome. a ton of clarity mm -hmm. as we sit here and kind of listen about mm -hmm. making this budget decision. So thank you for You're that welcome. time. I appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing this the launch year. I think it's mm -hmm. really exciting. And you guys have done some really nice work to figure out what to bring to our, our students in the realm of science. Thank you. I Derek. I mean. Holly, too. And Holly, and Holly. excuse me. Um, because it could have been easy just to pick a kit, mm -hmm. and you didn't do that because mm -hmm. you felt the kits didn't make sense for our community. And to be honest with you, we didn't pick it. I mean, we really, it was really, you know, Discovery Ed came in and did a presentation. Pearson came, you know, we, the teachers really had, you know, looked at these things and thumbed through them, and what was 
not only user friendly for our teachers, but what's user friendly for our, our kids. But it needs to be economical. I mean, we're we, you know we have Leslie going on, we have the math initiative going on, and it, there's a lot. And you know, to add something else to the play, you know, we want to make sure that our teachers are using it and, and the, the students are getting the full benefit. And when it's that add-on, you know, it, it's expensive. I agree. You know, but we want to make sure that it's being used and. Holly unfortunately can't be here. She is actually ill, and Derek had his daughter's recital tonight, so that's why I'm by myself. Because usually we're a team. So, <laughs> other questions? Well, again, thank you for coming. You're today. welcome. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. So, before we go on, Mr. Yeah. I just want to explain to Ms. Franco what we decided to do. Understanding that a quorum was going to take place, uh, we just did informational purpose. Uh, pieces on our agenda tonight nothing that required a vote later on okay. or nothing that require a vote at any time from the school committee so we'll, we're continuing on the superintendent's report and i believe at this point we might have something that would require a vote <laughs> right we've made it through one two four five six seven and now we go back to number three uh, on the agenda of the student handbook uh, revisions um, and in this case we're going to go reverse order starting with the high school and uh, invite Mr. Andy Dizel, Assistant Principal, Middlebrook High School, down to the microphone um, just to give us a quick overview of some changes in um, some items in the MHS handbook, understanding that this is a timely uh, affair here in terms of making sure we get this out to the printer and et cetera, et cetera. So welcome, Andy. Appreciate you coming. Thank you very and, much. Uh, <coughs> good evening. There you go. Great. Good evening. Did we win? Congratulations. Um, I hope that you are all in receipt of the updated handbook, uh, as well as a, a cheat sheet, if you will, with the 10 itemized changes that we've offered for you this evening. Um, I'll very quickly uh, go through the list with some brief descriptions uh, of each item. And if there are any questions, of course, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, number one, the science lab safety protocols. At the behest of the department, we added those just to have um, all of our safety boxes checked off. And since we are, um, a, a, you know, a, a full-service science department, we've got our lab sciences going. This clearly could not happen online, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and so we want to make sure the students and parents know exactly what our safety protocols are. Now they're in there. Um, we've updated our mission, our district mission, uh, on page six of the handbook. Uh, personnel and contact information has all been changed, um, as, ha as have the dates for the open house, parent-teacher conferences, and exam schedules, as number six indicates. Um, just a, a small addition of color-coded passes. Um, as an administrator, uh, one of my main tasks is to maintain the, the safety and security of the building and to make sure that our students are where they should be uh, when they should be there. And instead of stopping and, and having to question every student uh, where they are in the building, we moved to a color-coded pass system so we can visibly see from down the hall that Billy has a blue pass and a blue is for the first floor and he's good to be here and, we're, and he's all set. I can say hi to Billy and he can go on with his day and I can go on with mine. Uh, and we have three different colors for the f different floors and we found that that works very effectively. We also have one pass per room to uh, eliminate the, the frequent flyers and the number of kids that might be out of the classroom at the same time. So that has also been uh, a success as well. Um, our late bus policy, we've found that um, when we have late buses on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, that's a great resource for our students uh, to access a ride home when they need extra help or have business in the building. Um, However, we, we tightened up a little bit because we don't have any provisions for uh, supervision for those students at all times in the after school hours on those three days. So what we've moved to do is we're gonna take one of our safety supervisors. Uh, we have staff that serve a uh, stipend and position of safety supervisors and we're gonna move one of those uh, positions to after school hours so that they can be housed in the library to offer uh, academic support and a main central hub for those students to be in a supervised location. And so we just articulated that in the handbook. Um, code of conduct, we've had an e-cigarette provision for years now. However, we just uh, made the, the addition of the term e-cigarette in our um, as close as comprehensive list as we can make it, um, just to be more clear about our, our linking of e-cigarette to tobacco products uh, for our code of conduct. 
Um, food and drink delivery clause. Didn't think I'd ever have to, to, to go this way, but we've, uh, we have had in the past some instances where students um, come in late with a few extra Dunkin' Donuts coffees for their friends, expecting to be able to get it to them. However, we're nixing that all together in black and white, so that's all that does. Uh, of course, we allow for parents to drop off lunch money or lunch for their child or their designee. Um, however, that designee uh, will not be a friend that just went to Dunkin' Donuts is now late, you know, 10 minutes for school. So uh, we're cutting down on that. Um, yes, sir. Somebody couldn't call up Subway and have a delivery made to the school either. That is correct. Right. That, that ha attempt uh, has happened, and we've, we've also put a, a kibosh on that as well. Um, pizza in the back deck, absolutely. Um, our bell schedule, uh, Project Success, um, I think has been a wildly successful addition to our, our school community, um, and their schedule will now be found in the handbook. Um, and lastly, number 10, uh, a local chemical health rule that we've had in play for years was simply clarified um, in our handbook and, and just really trying to explain better the in the presence of clause that we've had in place for, I, I think, since the paling days, and that probably goes back about 30 years. So um, we felt as though the, the verbiage in the handbook as it was was not clear enough, and so we clarified that to um, alleviate any questions. Applies to when when you sit through when you're a parent and sit through the fall meeting and the spring meeting. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on social media, you know, think being things being posted to social media where student athletes are there with and photographs coming back to the school that kind of thing. primarily yes sir. Um, in the very rare occasion that we become aware of, of a photo or of an event and we're brought evidence uh, of that, uh, a police report, et cetera. Um, there is a clause that very clearly says now in the presence of um, any prohibited substances that are defined by the MIAA as well as Middleborough High School locally. So, so again, that section on page 122 is just simply to clarify that rule. Questions? Yes. I was going to bring up that piece because I always say it says in the presence of, so if a, st a student athlete or a student is in the presence of sitting at their table at home with a grandparent having a glass of wine. We're not talking about that. We're talking about nefarious things, I would say. Uh, um, I still, when I thought of the in the presence of, I always say to myself, what if you had the child with the license and the designated driver trying to get the kids home because someone called? But, you know, that's, I'm sure that is something that, Unfortunately, there are consequences of action. You're there, and you should have sent your parent instead if you got called. So I guess students should know this, um, and I understand why it's there. So I would never stop, not vote for this, because I think it's exactly what needs to be, because uh, people need to take responsibility for their actions. And just being in the presence of it is guilt by association. I've always said that to my own children. So. Thank you. We, we, we do the best that we can, and I think that um, with some new programs that the high school is offering, we're going to make a, a better effort to really uh, urge our, our students to, to be better decision makers in, in today's climate. Obviously, as time goes by, it gets in, it more increasingly difficult to make those good decisions uh, for a myriad of different reasons. Um, however, there, there, it, there are clauses that provide for uh, administrative um, Oversight, uh, you know, th there is a, a due process here. It's not just, oh, hey, we saw a photo, you're suspended for 25, 60% or what have you. Um, there are processes in, in play here and, uh, and we dutifully go through them to make sure that there is fair and equitable uh, administration of, uh, of these rules. But thank you for that clarification. There are also appeals to the process. So yes, there are. They can appeal to the principal, they can appeal to the superintendent. There are ways that they can move forward if they don't feel they've been treated correct. Correct. Um, Mr. Dizel, the only question I have for you is I know at times you'll start working on ideas that you have and maybe not be ready to add them to. Is there anything that you, you started working on or thought about um, that just didn't make it or that you're thinking about just for the future? Sir, at this moment, yeah. these items represent all the ideas I have. <laughs> in, a, in a collaborative effort with the staff that work with me to uh, to put in pl uh, in play these changes. So thank you. at this time, this is uh, a good representation. Thank you. 
Any other questions for Mr. Dizel? If no one objects, even though I didn't put it on the action item, um, there is an issue of making sure this is ready for printing and everything like that. And, and I know we want to make sure, you know, part of the part of our responsibility as a school system is to make sure the students know what the rules are and can read the rules and have the opportunity to, to follow them. And we can't do that if we don't give them to them on time. And so, if no one objects, I would entertain a motion to approve these changes. Mr. Chair. Yes. I would move that we approve the Middleborough High School Student Handbook 2017-18 presented, as presented this evening. Sorry. Second. Discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Tizel. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Anyone in the audience have a question? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Second school representative this evening is uh, old friend Greg Thomas, the assistant principal at Nichols Middle School, former school committee member, who's here to present the proposed handbook changes for the Nichols Middle School. Welcome, Mr. Thomas. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, Nichols Middle School, we don't have a, a bunch of changes this year. We have um, actually minimal changes. We did a, a lot of the, the bulky work last year when Mrs. Ray and myself came on with Mr. Gagan. So, uh, page seven, under dress code, uh, it sounds a little silly, but blankets or other clothing that drapes down or is considered a tripping hazard will not be allowed. We didn't have a ton of students running around in blankets, but sometimes the middle school kids um, would wear clothing that they would say, well, it's not the dress code. Well, now it's in the dress code, so we're, we're addressing that. Um, page 11, under tobacco, we added, uh, this includes all e-cigarettes and paraphernalia used to vape. Um, page 12, um, we talked about the agenda books, which, which I can address in a minute, um, making a change there. Page 14, under discipline, we added paraphernalia to use to vape, because uh, we didn't have any language about vaping or e-cigarettes in our, our handbook. Um, and then the other changes were just uh, contact information that mainly appeared in the appendices that um, the other schools had to do as well. And of course, we updated our um, vision. Uh, the primary change we did do was the agenda books. Um, with the advent of all students having a tablet, uh, we primarily use our agenda books for um, writing down homework assignments and that sort of thing. Uh, the sixth grade this year, at the end of the year, um, came up with a Google Doc uh, that they're going to use uh, for all homework assignments so parents can uh, find uh, the homework easily and accessibly via the, the, the computer. Um, eighth and seventh grade is also going to use that as well. Uh, eighth grade primarily will still be using the agenda books, so we still will be printing uh, agenda books, and they're for the students that want to use agenda books next year, they will be available to them as well. Uh, one of our concerns was by going digital, uh, we want to make sure, of course, that the um, the handbook is, is made available. And at the bottom of every single page of every single day will be a link to um, the handbook. So the parents will be uh, continually reminded of where they can find it. Uh, they, of course, will uh, still have to sign off on the handbook um, saying that they've seen it and read it and, and, and know the rules and guidelines of, of Nichols Middle School. Um, but that's primarily, primarily our changes. Mr. Thomas, how much money would you would you save by not per, uh, publishing the agenda books? I asked Mr. Gagan, and he said uh, it would be thousands of dollars, like three to five thousand dollars, I believe, is what Mr. Gagan said. Um, we would, of course, any any parent that wanted a hard copy of the the, the handbook, we would certainly make that available. But I have yet to have a parent um, ask about. Not that, we, that they are available via the agenda, but I don't envision um, any requests like that. Lest anyone think that we would discriminate against somebody wearing a, uh, an item, clothes that may drape, if it was a religious gown, right, we absolutely. would never do that. Absolutely. So I know, although we say that it's for safety purposes. This is more more costumes than, yes. than, than anything else. Exactly. Thank you. When you mentioned the e-cigarettes not being included, the number of budding attorneys that you get when you find somebody doing something and then they point out to you clearly because they've right. all read the the policy right. that you don't have that written in there. So and that that happens, and, it, and it's more. 
from the students and the parents, but it, it happens, um, which is why we made that change. But I would also say it's good because it shows the students do read the policy. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, oh, they're, they're the experts. They are the experts on the policy, that's for sure. Thomas, are, they, are students still wearing wheeled shoes? I noticed on no, page seven. No, those no, are kind of out of vogue, but yeah, no. those were popular for a while. Uh, yeah. Mrs. Andrade had a pair, I know. <laughs> yeah, we've... Uh, any other questions for Mr. Thomas? Uh, and then again, sure. the chair went in. I would move that we approve the John T. Nichols Junior Middle School uh, hand, uh, handbook for the year 2017 2018 as presented this evening. Discussion. Hearing none. Anyone in the audience have any questions? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Thomas, appreciate it. And next uh, up to the podium, uh, a couple of uh, our assistant principals, Chris Phoenix from the Mary Kay Good School and Jeremy Gobiel from the Henry B. Birkeland School are going to present the elementary school handbook changes, um, edits your approval. Thank you, gentlemen. We welcome you. Thank you. Um, Chris, raise your hand so people in the audience know Chris, the difference between Chris and Jeremy. Jeremy's right here. Jeremy's right here. <laughs> he just said raise your right hand. We're good. <laughs> so thank you and welcome and go right ahead. All right, great. Thank you for having us. Uh, Mr. Gobeal, Mrs. Hargraves, and I met several times over the course of the year um, with and without teachers to review the elementary school student parent handbook. These conversations occurred through formal handbook review meetings, discussions in PLCs, and staff meetings. Ultimately, we looked at the entire document and have proposed certain edits for the 2017-2018 school year. You have these proposed edits in front of you, and we'll be, we will be going through these tonight with you. Um, there were edits made that are not included in your notes. These include updates to staffing, um, as well as corrections to typos from last year's handbook. What we will discuss with you tonight include proposed changes to some of the content of the document. We're happy to address any questions you have as we review them. Good evening. Thank you. Um, first thing I'd like to point out is that we didn't make any changes to our um, student parent handbook in regard to the e-cigarettes. We haven't quite gotten to that, that point yet where we've had to address it, but um, who knows at some point um, that, that may be coming. And so exactly. You're surprised at what we find and what we deal with in the elementary schools, unfortunately. Um, so we're just going to go through this list of, of the, the changes and, and obviously any questions that you guys have, we, we can certainly stop and talk about them at the time or if, if you want to wait till the end, we could do that as well. Um, page 14, um, we took out the, the, the part about a doctor's note is, is, not, is the only grounds for an excused absence. That's just not accurate. We, it, we changed the language a little bit in there because um, funerals, wakes, religious holidays is, are, are also included as, as acceptable um, um, absences. Um, we did talk a little bit, uh, changed a little bit about the, um, the attendance and truancy. Um, in regard to, um, we, we sent home a letter um, that address when we have students who, who come up on our radar as far as um, attendance and truancy. And in that letter, we outline, um, we, we added the section about this could include notifying the Division of Ch Children and Families, um, Juvenile Probation, and or the local courts, because that's been a pretty, pretty um, effective method of getting people's attention. When they see that in the letter, it's sort of a checklist. And the first thing is I, we are aware of, of uh, the, the reasons for your students' absences and we're not taking any action at this time. The next one is please call our supervisor of attendance um, and then and it goes on through the list. So just having that added in there um, really seems to help with um, communication with, with parents and um, families as well. On page 16, the, um, the issue with crutches, kids were um, using crutches on the, on the buses. That seemed a bit outdated, so I had spoken with our nurse, Jen Calagero, who gave me the information. So we're going to add that section in there about the, the, uh, the policy around what that's supposed to look like if your child is, is temporarily using crutches and how that works. There needs to be communication between the nurse's office and the administration and the bus company and the parents. On page 18, our, in regards to our lockdown procedure, we added, we, in, um, we're proposing that we, we would add the um, ABCs of MPS uh, emergency response options. Um, that's just a policy that's already been accepted and approved by the school committee. Uh, we wanted to put that in there in, in regards to the lockdown procedures, that there are options and not just the, just the, the blurb about the lockdown itself. And, and just to be clear, that the ABCs are tough for people to read. Um, this year, across the district, all the schools had uh, emergency personnel come in 
and talk to the kids about the ABCs. That's correct. Right. So I just wanted to make sure that people understood that particular piece too, that it isn't like we're just writing this in the handbook and then forgetting about it. Correct, yeah, all the students have been trained, all the staff have been trained, obviously. Um, we will continue to, to train all of our students next year and we will actually practice um, a lockdown, which will which be different than what we had done in the, in the previous, which was the true, just that traditional lockdown where everybody just kind of hides and we'll look at the options and, and encourage um, teachers to talk to their students about the options as well and to practice them. We get to page 23, um, instructional programs, is a, there's, there's a lot of it that we, we sort of removed the, the whole section and sort of replaced it. There's not a whole lot of changes in there, um, but we did re just kind of replace the whole section. There's, um, Mrs. Andre addressed the, um, the science and the description of the science, um, the impl implementation of the Discovery Ed Science tech book. Um, so that wording in there is a little bit different than what was in there previously. Um, the social studies and history, we'll continue to use the, the books. There's some, some language changes in there, nothing major. Um, use those books as resources. Um, history is, is really embedded in our ELA units of study. Um, math, in regard to math, we'll be consulting, so we added in there with uh, Susan Looney. Um, we'll be using um, our, we'll be can, um, she'll be consulting with us as, as on, on the elementary level. And we included also a math workshop model which you can see in there, the, the previous uh, had been the, the readers and writers workshop models had been included in there. And then, um, small change on page 31 in regard to the um, health and physical education, just the language around instead of it being um, every, every five days that we changed our, our schedule so that it, we're on a six day rotation now, so just changing the language to us, the kids will get health and uh, we'll get phys ed twice every six days. And then the last piece is the, um, the homework. And it's just the, the last couple sentences in there. We sort of wanted to clarify, and we've had several conversations, conversations about sort of the philosophy of homework and what the purpose of homework is. And so just adding those last couple of sentences about homework is not meant to be a time where parents are teaching new skills, but rather an opportunity for students to develop responsibility. Those last couple sentences we, we are proposing that we add and change. And I think that was it. Questions? Starting on the first page, page 14, we talk about attendance and truancy. Um, this just came up in another community, and as you're addressing this specifically at this time, although an ex absence may be excused, is it still recorded as an absence on the report card? It is. Okay, I just it just came up in a school district where a parent, and it may or may not end up in court, that the parent wanted a student to be recognized as having 12 perfect. years of no perfect, absences. Perfect attendance. Perfect attendance. Mm -hmm. Just because you're absent, you're not in the school district. You're not there that day. It's excused. We're not going to go after you for truancy, right. but you're still not there. Correct. And we, we've dealt with that a couple times, too, because we wanted to, to recognize students who have had perfect attendance. And when we say perfect attendance, it means no absences, <coughs> no tardies, no dismissals. And, and being a you know, parent of three children myself, like they take great pride in going to school every day. And it's still like we, we still have to get them to the dentist sometimes. We still have to get them to the doctors if they're you know, kind of sick or whatever. So yeah, that, that's come up a couple yeah. times. Actually, with the flu epidemic, a few years back, they actually started to discourage pro schools that were encouraging perfect, perfect attendance, attendance because the kids were going to school sick yep. and getting other children sick. So um, even though it's, it's great and it's laudable when, when it happens, there's no doubt about it. Um, and it should be admired, however, uh, perhaps not encouraged in a wholesale manner, especially if it involves children who are ill, who are going to school ill. And I agree, Mr. Lynch, I think that, that there should be some language in there around, like we don't want children to come to school sick, you know, if they have a fever. We don't want them coming to school, but it doesn't necessarily meet the threshold of having to take them to the, to the doctor. I mean, again, being a parent, you know, that's a $20, $25 copay and the inconvenience of having to get them there. And you, you know, it's just a little bug, it's, you know, but I agree with you. I think everything you told us tonight was pretty straightforward and makes sense. Um, it, although it seems like a lot of changes, it's, it's really just changing, um, especially around the idea of what we're currently using and what we're currently doing. So I don't think that anything should be shocking to people. 
and I'm thankful that you haven't had the e-cigarette problem. So uh, <laughs> I'm glad about that. And Mr. Chair? Yes. The, the piece that you talked about on notifying the Vision Network and necessary and juvenile, that piece that's added in that letter, I, I think that is appropriate. I think people need to know that it could rise to that level if your student has missed 35 days in the first half of the year. Truancy is still illegal. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. Plus, you need to educate your child or your child needs the education. It's not your choice. It's the child's education. It is. It's um, law. And I appreciate that. And, and it's not a slight against parents it's just you need to get your, you make sure your child gets to school um, we do everything in our powers buses availability if there's a problem I'm sure we can figure something out if we have to uh, figure out figure out a solution to problems but um, as harsh as that sounds I when I read that I said unfortunately we have to do it and I think I don't know if you've seen the letter but I can provide you with the, the letter that, that we oh, sent once and no I didn't mean it I didn't mean it as a no, 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 not, not me person <laughs> I got a call and it was emailed to, okay. to me I was yeah. like oh and just that it's not on there it's a it's a it's a visual and it's it's you know this yeah. is what we're doing this is what we're doing or this is what we're doing and and it, it gets some some people they, they go whoa we, they could call DCF or they could call the courts and it sends a message there are resources available to us and, and obviously Megan Quirk and Family Resource Center is another one of those that mm -hmm. family needs assistance or help in getting their children to school you know we can do that and then the school resource officer is just that he he's a policeman yes but he's there as a resource for families also to and because there are occasionally those folks that say I just can't get him out of the house in the morning a little bit and a little bit of assistance in that regard go a long way but also as much as there's assistance and everything like that there is a requirement upon the school system that when things rise to a level you are required to file and, and you don't have a choice um, and I think that's the piece um, that people are laying out I deal with this every day and one of the things I always tell people is to just have conversations with the family let them know that you don't have a choice you have to do things because the law requires you to do things and I think that you know by putting it in here we're just showing people that there are there are things out here that you're required to do um, that you know we're going to work in steps to get there but in the end if I'm required to do something I have to do yeah and there's a continuum there's you know the first thing is please call and notify or have a conversation with for us it's, it's Lisa McDonald's who's our school psychologist she's our um, attendance officer and it's just, just explain the circumstance and, and that that's the first thing that, that needs to happen any further questions Mr. Chair, yes, I would move that we approve the elementary school handbooks for the Early Childhood Center, Mary Kay Good, and the Henry B. Berkland for the 2017-2018 school year as presented this evening. Very second. Second. Discussion. Hearing none, again, and anyone in the audience have a question? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Chief Thank, Thank you. Gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you, you very much. It. Have a great night. I'm just going to go through the MSBA discussion uh, just briefly. As Brian mentioned earlier in the meeting, the biggest piece with the high school update is that there is a special town meeting this coming Monday night at 7 o'clock. We need a quorum of 150 people. It is to buy the Wood Street property currently owned by the Archdiocese behind the high school. It will allow us to create a second entranceway um, no matter what happens with the high school. Um, both chiefs, uh, fire and police are in belief that there should be two separate entrance ways into and out of the high school. Um, and if we are fortunate enough and the town allows us to build a new high school, it'll allow construction equipment to come there and not be intermingled with students and parents and school buses. Um, and so that I would say is the biggest. We are continuing to discuss um, everything to do with this project including what the entranceway is going to look like that's the big topic of discussion now and that'll be a decision next week i believe we're looking at the building mass now actually 3d models of, of what the school might look like and there's discussion about the architecture of the entryway and and things such as that and that will be at the next week's school building committee meeting um which will be at, at the town hall which is an open meeting so. And the other piece that everyone should know was school ended yesterday. Yes. Today began soil sampling. 
Yes, the high school. In so the back of the high school. Going on related to the project. <clears throat> so just so everyone knows, that's the equipment that's going up back there. Uh, the Mac? <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, Greg. The school building. Next week, I believe the meeting is at 5 o'clock. I will confirm before what, the end of our meeting. I believe day? it's at 5 o'clock. To double check. I can certainly check. But what day was it? Wednesday. It's next Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. Thank you. I, it, there was a 5 or 5.30 question, I think, at it. So thank you very much for pointing that out, Brian. Five thirty, Wednesday, 5 June twenty eighth. Next Wednesday. Five thirty. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. The Mac. The Mac. The Mac. <laughs> uh, we have uh, our architect who's looked at the pro program and the, our compass, not compass. I'm sorry. ACG uh, is working with the MASBA to get this addressed and worked on through MDM Engineering. It's going to cost a little more, more out of the project, but it will be done uh, the right way and at reimbursement levels. So, so hopefully it will be done as soon as possible. It's an ongoing, it, we've sort of laughed at a couple times, but it's, we're at that point where it really, really needs to get done. So I think we've, and we've let those folks know that, that this has to happen sooner than later. And we've had some rainstorms where we haven't gotten any rain in, and then we've had some wind-driven rains where comes through the ceiling but it, it and does seep, places. But it still yeah. it leaks and it shouldn't leak. So it's just one piece. Anything else? No, okay. Sir. Then I'm going to move on. Uh, just school committee updates. Uh, again, we mentioned the summer uh, institute is July 28th through 29th. I know myself and Mr. Stevens are attending. If anyone else wishes to, please let me know. And the other one is the annual meeting in November for MASC. And the reason I bring it up is there is a, if you uh, pay before, if you pay in before July, it's a cheaper rate. So if any school committee members know they're going, I know the superintendent and I are planning on going. If anyone knows they're going, please let us know and we'll make sure you're booked in. All right, for action items. Now, uh, I'm just going to take the first one, uh, secretary's contract. Mr. Chair. Yes. I would move that we approve the, the middle, let me get the... Let me get it in front of me so I can word it correctly. Okay. I move that we approve the Middleborough uh, Secretary Contract AFSCME Council 93 Local 1700 uh, agreement as presented this evening. Do I a second? Second. Discussion. Mr. Chair. Brian, you want to give an outline? That would be yeah, this, 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 um, this contract is... Uh, with the Middleborough secretaries, uh, both full year, partial year, and, and um, executive secretary level secretaries. Um, it includes three years uh, starting last July um, with increases in salary of 2% each year. Uh, it includes uh, anyone with 25 years or more with longevity. Um, and it's in line with some of the other contracts that we have. The, the longevity of $900 is the most after 25 years that you stay with that district that long, you get that. Um, there was talk of, there's an item in here for the summer work. Um, summer work is offered to the building secretaries themselves within there before it's offered outside to the other secretaries. But no matter what, they, we do have to have secretaries working. Um, see what else was in there that was really changed um, other than the American arbitration or labor relations connection which was a less expensive way of arbitrating a, an issue if necessary but that was pretty much the nuts and bolts and these are pretty much consistent with all the contracts we negotiated yes um, Brian and I started and Mr. Noon started along with the superintendent and Kathy started negotiations last August with this particular contract and we've been working on it ever since. And, and Mr. Chair, this also included a change in the, the way steps are accrued. Um, and it was a more fair way uh, for them as they, they saw it um, to have their steps be accrued. Um, 
based on their years of service. Any uh, other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Um, the chair recognizes that um, what is our usual practice is to discuss uh, contract uh, in an executive session beforehand uh, and then take the actual vote out in open session. Uh, we don't have to do that if the members don't necessarily want to do that. Um, the ESP contract is, um, you know, I think we've had this discussion all along in executive session. You've all known exactly what we're going to do. So if no one objects, I'm going to take this one up next in open session, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, do I have a motion to accept the contract? I would, I would move that we approve the ESP contract as presented this evening. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion. Ms. Gimanoni, can you give us an outline again? I would if I had it at my fingertips. It's the same 2%? It's increase. the same 2% increase. Um, longevity, oops, sorry. Thank you. Um, sorry. Pretty much it's the same 2% uh, going back to July 1st of this past year. Um, there's more clarification in the evaluation process with the form work that was um, put in it so that one of the things that we implemented uh, four years ago under our previous set of contracts is we were going to be putting together evaluations of everybody. Everyone's evaluated uh, whether, whether you're in the classroom, out of the classroom, support personnel, everyone gets evaluated. And it's, um, if you're going to do it for one, you do it for all. I think it's only fair. And, and we, didn't, we didn't really fine tune it until this, this contract, so I'm glad we did. We clarified. Um, the, the two other pieces I can think of off the top of my head, Mr. Benoni, is one, um, there's an opportunity when they take over a classroom right. for an extended period in time exactly. to receive a bump for that. And the other piece that we added yep. to most of the contracts, uh, Mr. Benoni, was there is a provision that allows uh, members who currently have health insurance with the town to opt out and get um, a reimbursement piece for that. Right, and the secretaries had that originally in their contract. They were the only ones who had it three years ago. This is included in all our next contracts that we've had, um, and the ones that we've approved so far have had it in it. Uh, this contract would have it in it if it's approved this evening as well. And it also adds a step five. It added a step five. For those who have a bachelor's degree, bachelor's degree. Uh, or the, the licensing and bachelor's degree at 15 years, I believe, or 10 years and a bachelor's degree. And we yes, wanted a bachelor's degree 15 years with an associate's degree or a ESP certification. Also which, a which does recognize their, their, their devotion to mm -hmm. being a top right, of the line. Their longevity ESP. with yeah. the district and their, yeah. um, in a CDA kindergarten ESPs are certified in early childhood over and above and they are if they maintain that certification they're entitled to a small stipend any questions about that hearing none the chair went to uh, chair would take a vote all those in favor aye, aye. opposed it's unanimous um, the only current contract that is left outstanding is mini bus drivers Mr. Chair, yes, I would move that we approve the meeting, the regular session meeting minutes of January 19th, 2017, as presented. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed. It's unanimous. Mr. Chair, yes, I would move that we approve warrants numbered 475, 486A, 501, and 510, as presented this evening. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, man. Mr. Chair? Yes. I would move that we authorize the superintendent to be on the board of directors at PCC. Try a second. Second. Discussion. Uh, other than this is an annual thing, and I believe you have a leadership role. Vice President. There you go. Um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Mr. Chair. Yes. I move that we approve the Middleborough High School Class of 2020 Crazy Days booth fundraiser. Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. And we have the surplus equipment. 
Mr. Chair. Yes. I would move that we declare the two true refrigerators, models T48 and T49, uh, as presented this evening by Rebecca Bagnell, our food service director, dated 6-15-2017. Joy Harris, second. Surplus. Second. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes. I'd like to welcome Mary Farley, Mary Kane, Jessica Card Cottarelli, Emily Savage, and Christy Goldman to our ranks here in Middlebar. And Ms. Farley's been here for a while. She is just changing positions. Yes. yes. So that's fantastic. Um, Chair, would like to people to know um, about our next meeting. Uh, we, we had a brief discussion beforehand, Mo. Uh, right now, we're going to try to hold the meeting um, July 13th because we need to deal with the bid. Mm -hmm. There is a potential that the bid might be later than that, depending on a couple of factors. So we may either move it, or we may hold the meeting the 13th and then hold one session the week after just to do the bid. So um, with no objection currently, the plan is to hold it on the 13th. Um, unless anyone has any questions or anything, Chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you.